Welcome to the sixth meetup of Ministry of Testing in Athens. Here is Nikos Chaldeos, Georgios Kalfopoulos, and I'm Petros Plagoyanis. Today, our meetup is fully dedicated to Jenkins. With regards to testing, Jenkins is a powerful way to determine when, where, and how to run your automated tests. The basic subject today is called GitOps, Jenkins X, and the future of continuous degression, continuous delivery from Kosike Kaoguchi. I would like to welcome Kosike here in Athens. Thank you for joining us. Also, we have two light talks. Modeling your learning testing process from Konstantinos Karakis and Jenkins with Docker, Zalenium, and Report Portal, a combination that rocks from Vasilis Petru. Before we start, Nikos will remind you of how you can become a member to our community, and Yorgos will host the event. So, welcome to all of you, and be prepared to walk away with more than you came in with. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you to each and every one of you that uh, are here with us today. We are very pleased to welcome uh, our old uh, loyal uh, members as well as uh, uh, new members that I can see in, uh, in this theater. Uh, we are, uh, <coughs> our community steadily increases. Uh, we have close to 1,000 members. And uh, for today's event alone, we had uh, around 400 reservations. So thank you for your uh, uh, response and uh, your presence. Um, in, the, in the presentation that soon is going to be available at the website, uh, the community website in Meetup, you will find all the useful information how to become uh, the next speaker or the next sponsor, or uh, just a volunteer uh, in, the, in the next uh, meetups that are uh, scheduled. Uh, additionally, keep uh, sending us uh, your comments, your feedback, your recommendation at uh, motath.org uh, at uh, gmail.com. They are always welcome and very useful to us. Uh, help us improve and uh, uh, plan, give us strength to plan even more uh, uh, great meetups. Uh, additionally, there are in the same presentation that is going to be available, there are several links with the resources about uh, testing from uh, Ministry of Testing. We have uh, the famous dojo, we have uh, uh, we have uh, the meetup.com with uh, uh, updates about our community, as well as the uh, joining the Slack uh, channel to communicate uh, uh, about the latest, uh, to, to, to get informed about the latest development of our community. Of course, there is a Facebook uh, group that you can always join and uh, send us your feedback uh, there. Thank you very much. Now I pass to George. Okay, welcome from me as well. Uh, you really need to see, you see here, well, you're not up here, so you cannot actually see the whole audience uh, there. So it's um, really a uh, very nice thing to see, like the full room, the room full of people. Uh, I would like to give a big thank you to all of our sponsors because, okay, a meetup of this size cannot really happen without the support of uh, companies uh, that uh, help us all the way. And particularly our greatest sponsor, our big sponsor for today, it's Unisystems. They are covering uh, the party, the food later on, pizzas and cocktails. Uh, Certainly a big thank you to Agile Actors that uh, covered the cost for uh, the traveling costs and the uh, um, hotel and the stay of Kosuke. Uh, Epignosis that will uh, cover the coffee and that you will see later in the, um, in the break uh, as well as the beers up later up in the party. Uh, Beat for uh, actually covering the nice name tags that you now see that we are now wearing all of us. 
Hellenic American Union that gives us the space here, and we will uh, hear a little bit more from her, from Mrs. Eleni later on. Uh, our permanent sponsor, Transis, that uh, covers a number of minor uh, costs that uh, every meetup has, plus the after-dinner party that we have tomorrow. And uh, Intrasoft, that uh, today is um, sponsoring uh, a ticket for uh, Selenium Conference London, will have a draw later in the end of the night. And finally, Atos, for uh, their constant support. Uh, you will see them again on our next meetups, and we hope for the best to continue this uh, cooperation with all of our sponsors. Okay. Uh, before we continue, I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Eleni from Hellenic American Union to tell us a couple of words about what they do here. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. Hello, hello, and welcome at, at the Hellenic American Union. My name is Eleni, Eleni Chirigoti. I'm responsible for the professional development training programs at the Hellenic American Union. Uh, we are very happy to, to host one more event of the Ministry of Testing Athens, which I see it's going to be a huge success. I see a big group here. And uh, seeing you, I have uh, one question, and I want you to help me. Is who here is a tester, a tester to the, to the core? Could you please raise your hands? Okay, good. I think you are in the right place at the right time because the Ministry of Testing Athens, they have prepared for you an amazing event with many surprises and a very special guest speaker that has come from the other side of the planet for, for you to, to share his expertise and knowledge. Um, I would like to say a few things about the, the learning hack. This is one of the things that, that we do at the Hellenic American Union. Uh, the learning hack is an initiative where we host events and uh, professional uh, uh, communities such as the Ministry of Testing, they come, they come here and they share their experiences, their uh, uh, knowledge, they, n they, netwo the ne they network and they grow. Um, I would like, personally, I would like to congratulate the organizing committee of the Ministry of Testing Athens because they are doing an amazing job and they are doing it on a volunteer basis, which is very important. Um, I would like to, to say just one more thing okay. about our contest the, today. Um, it's, very, it's very easy. We have two, the Ministry of Testing Athens has two uh, prizes. We're, we're very happy that we can co contribute and we have offered a free uh, re registration to one of our project management courses. And the other prize as the I think uh, Petro said before, it's a conference in London, uh, an international conference on, on uh, t testing. Uh, the process to enter the, the contest, allow me just to re repeat it one more time, because I see a few people that have just come uh, in. It's very easy. Uh, you, you scan this uh, code. There are posters all around the, the room. Uh, if you have an iPhone, you can immediately scan it and you enter a form where you leave your uh, um, contact uh, information. Or you have uh, an Android, maybe the app, maybe the camera won't work. You just go into um, this URL, this bit.ly slash HAU uh, HR, and you immediately enter the, the form and you enter the uh, contest. I think it's pretty uh, easy. So uh, enjoy. Have a very good uh, evening, and I pass you to the good hands of George again. Thank you. Thank you, Eleni. Okay, we will uh, start with uh, Kostas from Atos. Come up. Hello, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks to the guys that set this up for the Ministry of Testing meetups. I'm very honored to be here, very honored to share the stage with uh, 
Koske. And the rest of the guys, Vasilis as well. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna go on and tell you a personal story about Jenkins. It's just about uh, uh, how I came to know this tool, how it affected my work. So just a few words about me. I'm just a tester. What kind of tester, you may ask? And why would you ask that? Maybe you were here the last time where uh, Ber van Dahl had his uh, talk along with uh, Simon Stewart. He talked about the four kinds of uh, testers. Uh, he uh, said that there are four kinds of learning styles, called learning styles, and he correlated with uh, four different types of tester. <coughs> the one I certainly belong to is the activist. Uh, what, does, what does that mean? It means that I, whenever I start to work with something new or start to, I have to test something new, I don't go to the documentation, I don't ask people around, I just dive in. I want to get a feel of the thing, I want to try it out, and this is wha when I decide if I like it, if it works, etc. I'm just kind of impatient, it's cool. Okay, my first encounter was uh, back many years ago. Uh, our team was uh, just coming out of the waterfall uh, model into Agile, trying it out. We're trying to see how to make it work for us, how to use it best. At that time, I was uh, part of a test and release team. We had uh, the, the testing team from the past, what did release, and we were uh, still working on how what else uh, we could uh, get into our uh, toolbox and uh, what we wanted to do, to do, we had a solution to test. Part of it was one product that belonged to our uh, company but we were not experts and uh, we, want, we wanted help on uh, making automatic upgrades. There was another team who were experts on this product and they, uh, they said they did do automatic upgrades and how they did it, they said they had this nice tool called Jenkins. So we asked them about it and they told us that they had a project in a uh, web uh, uh, interface that allowed them to do uh, automatic upgrades. It actually started a shell script. What we ended up doing was actually getting a whole clone of their VM to just get the Jenkins installation, which had the project inside, which started the shell script. Yeah, it sounds like huge overkill, but uh, yeah, we didn't know anything else about it then, and this is what we ended up doing. So. That fact alone didn't make me uh, very keen on uh, using it. I, of course, it was the wrong kind of uh, uh, circumstances. Also, I, I wasn't the one to actually do this task and I uh, was just a bystander looking at it. I was not impressed with the UI. It was not something fancy. I thought all screens looked the same. Job, build, main, I uh, got disoriented. Every time you press the button, you got the same screen. So. Again, didn't like it, sorry to say. So I, I went through a bit of a snub phase. I thought, okay, this maybe is not for me, not for us. Uh, I read about it a little bit, mostly by accident or by listening to other people's conversations. And uh, I, I read that it was uh, a tool to make a continuous integration, delivery, continuous testing, all these kind of things. Again, at this point in my career, I thought DevOps was a dirty word. I didn't want to be called that. I don't know why. Uh, again, wrong cir circumstances. So I thought maybe uh, it's not something that we can make use of because uh, our products are too complex, too big, too serious. Uh, it's probably for other people, maybe uh, a group of friends who created a startup and wanted to make a friendly, friendly plugin or a Pokemon to go. I really hope you get that IT crowd reference. If you don't, ask a question next week. Okay, however, uh, after a while, I started realizing something, which I believe is the, and maybe m many of you would agree, which is the, big, uh, the greatest strength that uh, Jenkins uh, gives us, is the sheer amount of plugins that you have, and uh, the, the fact that you can get everything, all your automation, all your tools, no matter what the uh, technology you have been using so far, or what kind of te technology you want to use, under the same umbrella. You can have a single project or a collection of projects to do anything. Is it Node.js? Is it Python? Is it batch files? Everything. You can get everything under one tool, which was great. We didn't have anything else at that point to uh, tackle this kind of uh, situations. So what we did, we started to uh, 
make it do all the dirty work for us. Uh, here's an example. We have, um, we've always had uh, a very big uh, integration test suite that we use uh, before uh, uh, every release. And uh, the bad thing, the bad thing, the dirty work in this case is you have to set everything up before you are ready to run. So you have to uh, set your uh, system to the right version, be it VMs that you have to upgrade, downgrade, switch, uh, snaps, etc. You have to build and collect the corresponding test cases in the correct version that correspond to that system version, etc. All this, we created uh, three different Jenkins projects and we combined them into a downstream execution. This was great. It was uh, fantastic to get all this stuff out of the way and just focus on the real work. Because before, in order to do all that stuff, we had to work at least for an hour before we were able to start the execution. And in cases, let's say, if it's a Friday and uh, the hotfix comes out at five and uh, you wanted to go home, well, maybe you want to run over the, over the weekend and you'll have to stay at work until six to do it, just to do this uh, silly stuff. Now you don't have to do this. You can just start the Jenkins job and we'll do it for you. And if, uh, even if the hotfix doesn't come at five, and you know that there's a developer working overtime to uh, get it out, you can just set your uh, schedule on Jenkins to run at 10 in the evening and again go home. Eventually the hotfix will come out and the, rest, uh, the job will start, will start and everything will be fine. No need for overtime. The, al the other great thing is, was for us that you didn't have to train someone uh, to do anything else than again the actual work, how to run the test cases and how to evaluate the results. You didn't have to uh, worry about when you're handing over your job to someone else or someone has to take over for you when you're on vacation. You didn't have to train them for a million things that don't, that don't matter. Just how to run a Jenkins job and how to evaluate the results. The greatest thing though that it did is it forced us to put our mind, mindsets uh, and our, uh, our way of uh, uh, implementing test cases and uh, our work in general into uh, into steps, into little boxes. Uh, one would come after the other. Everything had to fit together. And this was necessary for us to take the next steps in our technology. All great reasons to go dance. Okay, so we liked it so much that uh, someone else was doing the dirty work that we started doing it for everything. And uh, sooner or later, all our automation tasks were uh, being done by a Jenks job. Uh, and uh, in the end, we got everything uh, streamlined. We had uh, two, three, four separate uh, task groups and each one was a downstream execution. One for the end-to-end -end switch, one for the release, one for the integration test, etc. And uh, also uh, what came out of this was that we were uh, creating uh, uh, automation for things that were also popular in the company and uh, other teams also wanted to uh, be a part of. I mean, someone would uh, uh, would certainly want to do things that we were doing automatically for their own sake. Let's say again, like in our case, someone wanted to do an upgrade on a product that we were responsible for testing. We, we could just share our uh, Jenkins uh, project. Of course, not clone RPM with the whole uh, uh, operating system. Just let them run our uh, job. So we became heroes. Let's let's speak. For Jenkins, and uh, we uh, created synergies with other uh, teams in the in the company. Everything was great. Jenkins was was helping us do cool stuff, and we we were th uh, thinking that everything was fantastic. But as you know, what you know what happens to good things. Sooner or later, they have to end. And uh, sooner, I mean, th this came sooner than uh, rather than later. And uh, when we had uh, all these things in uh, Jenkins jobs, in uh, projects that were doing many things. Uh, we ended up with multiple Jenkins servers, numerous projects, no versioning for them, for the code inside the projects, no backup at all for any of that. And we were starting to feel a little bit scared what would happen. What's even worse, we had uh, uh, many different projects that were doing similar things, but uh, not quite the same. So we had many copied projects uh, doing uh, most of the stuff the same and with a little uh, twist. This meant that if we wanted to fix a bug in one of those, we had to remember to fix the bug 
interest as well, was a maintenance nightmare. Not to mention that if we wanted to do something new and uh, there was a new cool plugin out there that would do it for us, we had to, we were not able to install it because our Jenkins servers were old and we were afraid to upgrade because we, we wouldn't know what uh, would uh, go wrong. And again, no backup, no anything. Lo and behold, our savior Jenkins has code. We discovered uh, two plugins, fantastic, both of them, the DSL plugin and the pipeline plugin. What the DSL plugin uh, let us do was uh, it uh, gave us the capability to uh, describe all our projects, all our jobs in uh, Groovy scripts. Then they we would use this uh, Groovy scripts to create uh, job builders. So we would take these builders, this builder code and save it in Git and everything now was backed up and versioned. Everything then would be organized in a Gradle project that we could build every day to get the new uh, scripts uh, from Git. And with pipeline plugin, we rewrote all our downstream executions in uh, uh, Jenkins files and uh, turned them into pipelines. This uh, let us do uh, amazing flow control on our uh, uh, projects and uh, things that we didn't think were, pro uh, were possible before. We had amazing flexibility. And again, everything was code and was saved in Git and we could use it and we would uh, version it and back it up like that. We could also do cool visualization with uh, for pipeline, here's an example w from another plugin called uh, Blue Ocean that we also use. This is not uh, an example for, uh, from one of our pipelines. I took this from the internet, but I like it because in the end it shows that everything is done so that people can go dancing again. I don't know if you can read this. It says dance. So we had code reusability, we had versioning, we had flow control, and we could do all this uh, fantastic stuff that uh, we could do before. But now with uh, maintainability, efficiency, we had backup, uh, we could collaborate with people on Git to share each other's code and not have to rewrite it again, just include it in your uh, uh, DSL uh, script. And we could do fantastic combination uh, uh, as far as flow was concerned. And yes, in the end, we were asked to create a CI. Why? Because eventually we managed to find out how to do agile in our uh, company and uh, it was the next uh, the, the natural the next natural step so we created the ci easily everything was set up already pipelines were there the projects were there it was all in git all we needed was a nightly build to test and, it w and then everything was uh, everything fell into place and the discuss in the discussions in our company were now revolving around not if doing devops and continuous delivery is the right thing to do but what is what are we doing wrong and how can we fix it in order to be able to serve that purpose? And yes, after all that, I admit I felt kind of a fool for my initial stance. Whenever I see Jenny smiling, I think it's because he's smiling at me saying, you eventually saw my way, my, my way. So it's okay, I, I'm not mad. Uh, I believe that I just had to change. Everybody changes, people change, companies change. And it's a good thing, we have to embrace it, I embrace it. And in the end, who knows? In the future, we'll also be making token mess. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Costa. As usual, in the light talks, we don't have uh, questions. You can find Costas later on on the uh, networking. And uh, Launa, I would like now to ask uh, Vasilis from Mintrasoft, who come for the next light talk. Hello. Hello, Ministry of Test in Athens. Wow, <laughs> you are so many, but I have no stress. I will throw it. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you and congratulate you for this big success. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure for being here. It's also a great consequence because with Petros, uh, we get to know each other back in 2016 when we have, um, have been together in a Selenium conference in London. Uh, this was a great moment there. And as you can see, this was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, his first touch with Ministry of Testing, and here we are today. So 
a big bravo to all these guys, Petros and all the other organizers. It's a very good success. Okay, today I will talk to you about a combination of tools that actually improves uh, the test automation process. Um, but before I start, let me introduce myself. I'm sorry for uh, complicating my words. It's not so, so easy. Okay, my name is Vasilis Petru. I'm test automation leader uh, at Idrasoft International. Uh, with more than 10 years in software engineering as a full stack developer, uh, before four years about, I discovered the software testing and test automation. And this career change, because allow me to say it career change, uh, because it's another scope, uh, but technically there are many similarities, uh, came so physically because software quality was, also, uh, was always uh, my first concern. And as a test automation enthusiast I am, uh, I've started a series of lectures uh, in universities and institutions. It is very interesting because there are many students that does, doesn't even know that there, there exists career in software testing. And it is also, I can say that there, there is a real interest from students who are writing to me that they are starting their thesis uh, of university uh, related with uh, software testing and test automation. Okay. Intrasoft, the company I work for, I will make an adver advertisement, okay, for a salary to be raised. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, support such initiative, uh, okay, and invest in human resources. Uh, with more than 2,000 professionals and our headquarters in Luxembourg and uh, with offices in more than 13 countries, um, we have customers like uh, EU institutions and agencies. Uh, we have uh, customs, uh, taxations, uh, Eurostat, railways, banks, and many, many more. Not, I don't want to say many things. And uh, in Idrasoft, we have a separate and independent testing team. Uh, and this test center actually uh, offers uh, test services both for internal and external customers. We have uh, more than 50 uh, uh, software test engineers uh, and 20 of them about uh, are delivering software test, uh, test automation uh, implementation uh, solutions uh, by implementing completed test automation solutions. Sorry, I tried to remember what I wrote there. <laughs> Okay, here you can see a list of uh, technologies, tools that we work uh, in our company. And I mean real implementations. We have delivered things with all these now fancy uh, logos. Uh, and of course, picking our best friend Jenkins and some other tools, uh, we create a combination of tools uh, that rocks. A combina combination of tools that actually makes automation automated. And this is what we're talking about. But, but before I start, let me tell you also a story. Imagine you are a super duper team, a super duper team with Deadpool and other uh, cool guys. Okay, and you get a request from a customer for a test automation solution uh, where you will deliver uh, GUI automated tests, uh, okay, for uh, their web application. Okay, and as, as a super duper test team you are, you start at listing some uh, cool stuff you do as a team. Okay, so you're gonna use, you, you say that we will use a select web driver because we want our solution to be more flexible instead of using some tools that have some uh, limitations. Additionally, we're gonna use page object pattern uh, because, or screenplay pattern, anyway, patterns, because we're gonna have better maintainability, better maintenance. We're also going to use smart element locator, uh, locators. Do not search it in the internet, it's my definition. Uh, I mean, uh, we're going to find elements with a smart way in order to have also better maintenance and speed. Additionally, we're going to integrate our tests with Maven in order to be able to run the tests with a command line way or a continuous integration tool. Uh, we're going to use some reporting plugins in order to show our results in a pretty way. Blah, 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 blah. So after all this blah, 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 our customer is like Mr. Simpson, so excited. Okay, but there is one last question. Any idea? What about the installation steps? Okay, um, who of you didn't face uh, difficulties uh, related with uh, the preparation phase of our uh, um, by setting, preparing the environment before the test starts. I believe many. So I like COVID. And when we are starting to list the, um, the steps that we will do before the execution, our customers is like Tom. Yeah. 
So we are starting to make some brainstorms in order to find a solution that actually makes our tests really automated in order to make our automation uh, automated. And what I mean, you know, there are customers that have already set a continuous integration solution. They have Jenkins in, uh, in their site that we can just put our tests there and they can be executed like Cost has mentioned some very well uh, examples. But imagine that we want to, to give a portable solution, a plug and play solution where we have no access to the customer like we face with uh, some customers. So we have to, to, to deliver something just so with just one click, everything to be set, uh, the environment to be prepared, and with just one click, the test to be executed. So yeah, the idea came after some investigations, and what we actually do is to combine some tools in order to simplify the procedures. So, we're gonna use Docker. Docker will be the only software prerequisite for our tests. The only thing that someone, any stakeholder, uh, should have in uh, their laptops, PCs, uh, etc., would be only Docker. <coughs> we're gonna use, of course, Jenkins, because with Jenkins, we're gonna create some pipeline jobs. Uh, we're gonna um, uh, pre-configure our environment, our package, to have ready pipeline jobs in order to use it as a test runner, because it actually runs the tests. We're gonna use Selenium. Uh, where with Selenium, we're gonna use we're going to have the ability to run our test, our test in parallel, and uh, also we will be able to run them without any concern about operating system and browser versions, a common issue in web application uh, testing, UI testing. And of course, we're going to use Report Portal. Thank you, John Dimas. Because with Report Portal, we're going to have live uh, reports uh, during the execution of the tests. It is, it is very cool because we actually um, because we actually have uh, the results live and there are all, uh, all results are inside the URL. You don't have to open PDFs, you don't have to search files uh, in order to see the results. And we're gonna use some additional heavy tools like Fortainer. I recommend it for those who work with Docker because it's a nice, cool monitoring tool in order to see all the Docker containers that are up and running, and not only, you can manage all the Docker containers, images, networks, everything about Docker inside uh, this tool. And of course, we're gonna use some budget shell scripts uh, in order to run all the Docker commands in a sequence. Okay, here you see some screenshot. Uh, this is from the portainer where we have all the Docker containers running. No comment, we all know Jenkins. This is Alenium with four monitors. Uh, Georgos Romanas made a, a very good pr presentation about Alenium with four um, uh, nodes, four instances, four virtual monitors where when we start a test using Alenium, which is actually a dockerized Alenium grid, we're gonna see uh, windows opening, uh, browsers opening the, the test to be run. You're gonna see a real example after um, one, two pages. And this is uh, the report portal where we actually see live results of our test. So if we have uh, project managers that need to see the results, we just uh, tell, okay, visit this URL, and all the, resu the results is there. All the results are there, sorry. Okay, this is a sample of the deliverable package where we actually zip it and give it to the customer or we send it in some way. Uh, and as we can see, there are folders with pre-configured data that we need for all these addition for all these tools that uh, are used, and of course some executable files uh, in order to use uh, to use them for the for the installation and the run and the execution. So let's see a real example. Okay, I think I have to click. Okay, first we're gonna run, uh, we're gonna uh, okay, install Portainer with a simple click from our tools. Just to have this monitoring way, as we can see here, we visit this URL and everything's there. Okay, second step is to install and prepare everything. With just one click, here you can see the content of this, uh, of this file. We actually 
recreate all the Docker containers in order to be able to run it again and again. We create a network, a Docker network, in order to be able um, to bridge all the Docker containers. And of course, we install Jenkins in it, we install Selenium, and we install Report Portal. The installation starts, it's that simple. So during the installation, you're gonna see that we actually can, just for monitoring reasons, go to the URL of the container and check that everything is up and running. So you see first that Jenkins is up and running, and next we go on a visit Jenkins and you see that all the, pre all the um, pre-configured pre part is, uh, is there. Uh, actually, a, docker, a parameterized pipeline job is there to run the tests. You also see that report portal needs a lot of things. Uh, just to know that the uh, report portal needs five giga reserved from, uh, from your uh, machine. It's a little bit uh, demanding. And here you see that there are exposed URLs where all these tools are up and running. After all this, we just visit these URLs in order to see that everything is up and running really for the demonstration reason, because this video is also used for demonstration for our uh, customers. So you see that we have already set the, um, so the security part of, uh, uh, the authentication part of Jenkins. We have already a pipeline job, which is actually a parameterized pipeline job. Uh, what ex what ex actually is done is, is this. Um, there we also have in a Docker container the application under test. And the application under test is exposed in the URL where is actually a part of the network, of the Docker network gateway. So that in this pipeline job, uh, in this parameterized pipeline job, we actually get from the Docker container the gateway and we put it inside the test, um, uh, inside the, the test that will be executed. And of course, we, the, the way that we execute the tests is uh, via a nice um, ability of uh, Jenkins also, the Jenkins command line interface, again via Docker. So we run our test via, via Docker, via Jenkins CLI, the Jenkins uh, pipeline job. And we're gonna see now how, is it, how easy it is to run the test. Okay, the configuration, the, the way that we implement this is complicated, but when we give it to the customer, the things for the customer is very simple because as we understand, with just one click, everything we start, everything starts. You actually see, so here, the Selenium, and you see here the report portal, which will be empty, no results until the execution starts. Okay, with everything configured. And next, last but not least, the execution, where we actually Uh, gonna run the test. Here we can see the content of this tool. And with just one click, the tests are starting. So let's see what is going on. Okay, we're gonna open Zelenium and we're gonna see parallel tests to be executed. The way I implemented the test uh, is with Java, test and G. Um, and Selenium web driver, um, activating uh, the ability to have parallel tests to be executed. So you're gonna see here in three windows uh, tests to be executed. The application under test is a simple React.js calculator just for demonstration reasons. So you see that there are some tests that be executed right now. And visit the report portal you see that we have live examples, live uh, results, sorry. And as the execution ends, we can see now all the results. We can go to the steps and see uh, detailed steps of each test case. And what was the result? How long does it take to be executed? Uh, there are many statistics and things to, to see. This is the application under test, it's an indicative a uh, React.js calculator, just for this presentation. I wish you find it uh, pleasant, useful. Uh, this is where you can find me. 
uh, Bill Petru in GitHub, where I have actually some uh, examples that I also share with students about how to start with automation. I don't know if all of you uh, handle automation, uh, working with uh, test automation. Uh, there, there is content there to start. Uh, additionally, you can see, uh, you can find me in LinkedIn. Uh, I always say LinkedIn, I don't know why. And uh, these are my emails, business at personal. So thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'm here for you now or later. <laughs> thank you, Vasilis. Very insightful uh, presentation. And I would like to invite on stage uh, George Kodopidis uh, from Unisystems to tell us a few words about uh, Unisystems. Hello, everyone. Um, Thank you for being here. My name is George Kodopidis, and I've been working as a test automation engineer for the last 15 years. 15 years, and I'm still struggling to explain to my relatives what I do for life. Anyways. So let's see. Okay, how about Unisystems? Uh, Unisystems is uh, working with far too many projects, 180 plus. Uh, and uh, when we say that we are dealing with all these projects, we don't mean that it is necessarily for testing only. It's uh, also for development or services or support, etc. Uh, we do have more than 80 customers in uh, 25 plus countries. Um, I joined Unisystems two and a half years ago, and uh, when I joined, there was only one um, project that contained test automation, uh, the European Chemical Agency, and they only had uh, unified functional testing. Uh, this is um, a project that we took from, it, it, it had already the test cases written for us, and uh, we just take, took the maintenance of it. And everything uh, was uh, uh, written directly in uh, script. But uh, not much later, we started with a European medical agency, uh, where we use Protractor. Um, for those that don't know, Protractor is a uh, tool that can support also JavaScript. Uh, with Yasmin framework and Node.js, we had a load runner for um, um, performance testing, and of course, Jira. Uh, these are the main tools of this project, not all of them. And this is following a waterfall um, process. And recently, we also added to our portfolio EBA, uh, European Banking Authority. They are using Cucumber, Maven, of course, Jenkins, because they are um, agile. Uh, they have Gatling for performance, and of course, they use Jira. Um, another pro product that we use is uh, for Acer, uh, which is using the Selenium ID as it stands. Um, and this is all just in two and a half years. Uh, so, for us, um, the first thing that I would like to say, we are expanding. Uh, automation is now involved in more and more projects. We are using many more automation tools and technologies. Uh, all of our automation uh, engineers are trained and certified. And uh, we collaborate with testers from other companies. So two and a half years ago, we started with just one automation tester, and now we are 10. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. And uh, thank you, Unisystems, for all the support. And now it's time for Bit and Antonisissimos to tell us a few words.
Hello all. Um, my name is Antonis Ismos. Uh, I will give you a short five-minute presentation about BIT. It's my first time here in, uh, in this meetup. I'm very glad to see all of you. It's a very big uh, community. And uh, as BIT, we are uh, trying to uh, be part of the community. And um, <coughs> I'm Antonis Ismos. I'm uh, head of infrastructure in BIT. Uh, a few words about BIT. Uh, we've, we, uh, BIT uh, was uh, founded as TaxBIT in Athens at uh, 2011. Uh, our focus now shifted in uh, Latin America. We are operating in uh, Peru. And the last 18 months, we have expanded in Chile, Colombia, and Mexico. We are part of uh, the FreeNow Group, a uh, joint venture of uh, BMW and uh, Daimler. Uh, our uh, HQ is in Athens, uh, but we have a local presence in uh, every Latin America uh, country. Uh, our engineering hub is, uh, uh, our engineering headquarters is in Athens, but we are now very excited uh, that we're expanding with a new engineering hub in Amsterdam. We have uh, open positions for Amsterdam, and we are now in the process of uh, interviewing people. So we hope uh, uh, by the end of the year we will have another hub beside Athens, engineering hub. So we're very happy to, to, <coughs> to grow in a very, uh, and in very uh, we, are having, we are having a year-to-year -year growth ab about 100%, over 100%. That means that we are um, uh, we we grow both in people but in uh, market share also. Uh, we have over 600 uh, members globally, and over uh, 200. The slide is old. 200 engineers. Uh, very fast uh, speed. Very fast rate. Uh, a, a few a few words about uh, our uh, technology stack. Uh, the main stack is uh, PHP monolith. Uh, we try to uh, transition to microservices to make the transition. We have uh, we, ha we try we using uh, the strangling pattern. Uh, if you know this uh, pattern, it's uh, we try with small increments to uh, strangle uh, the features out of the monolith. We use Go as a preferred language for microservices. We use PHP for some services. We use also Python for our big data and uh, machine, learning, uh, machine learning group and the services that they produce. Our infrastructure is on Amazon. We are a heavy AWS user. Uh, we provision uh, our infrastructure using Terraform. We use Kubernetes for all the new microservices. Uh, we use our own uh, Kubernetes, not any managed uh, service, uh, to be able to, to avoid the vendor lo lock-in. Uh, so for testing, we use uh, tools like uh, Cucumber, uh, Jenkins, Appium, Java. We have a, a mobile automation framework that uh, um, runs uh, run tests for every uh, new mobile feature. And uh, we also have uh, a continuous uh, a CICD pipeline for all new microservices. We are trying to give uh, autonomy to squads, to teams that uh, have end-to-end uh, -end, uh, delivery of every feature. Every team uh, should, uh, we try to, um, to influence every team to, to the DevOps culture. Uh, to give operation to teams, so we try to develop CI/CD pipelines for using, for for a for for, for uh, giving the developers the ability to deploy to production. So we are uh, uh, investing heavily in testing. Uh, for microservices, we are uh, uh, now are uh, exp uh, investigating solutions like uh, like Pact for uh, contract testing. And, uh, and that's it. Uh, quick talk. Thank you, Adonis.
Thank you very much, and thanks a bit to your constant support. And now it's time for um, uh, epignosis and epignosis to tell us a few things about epignosis and. Uh, Hi everyone. Uh, so um, it's a bit stressful to be up here. So I am Evi. Uh, I work as a software engineer in test for Epignosis. Uh, Epignosis is a company that uh, leverages uh, uh, state-of-the-art technology uh, in order to provide uh, learning and education solutions for organizations all over the world. So uh, a little bit on for us. Uh, Epignosis was founded in 2012. Uh, while the idea sparked in 2001. Uh, we have three main products, uh, starting with uh, Efron, which is like the most mature one. Um, Talent LMS, which is considered to be our uh, flagship product uh, with a customer base of over 6,000. And uh, uh, we're 60% customers in North America. Uh, Talent LMS has a lot of similarities uh, with Efron in terms of uh, usability. And uh, last but not least, uh, Talent Cards, which is like uh, the new uh, product of uh, the company, uh, which is a solution, a mobile solution of micro learning where users can uh, learn through uh, cards. So, um, as you may, just check. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, currently, uh, we're 75 people working for uh, Epignosis, and this number is uh, expected uh, to grow up to 100 in the, uh, the recent uh, future, in the near future, sorry. Um, so, uh, as you may imagine, having uh, to support three products for both uh, web and mobile applications for such a customer base can be translated to many tickets, tons of programming, and of course, testing. So. Uh, in Epignosis, we have a, a newly built QA team uh, whose scope is to move towards uh, shi uh, shift left and uh, test automation, and of course, to the fight against the reverse of the testing pyramid. Uh, what we use, uh, what we do is that we perform tests for uh, web, uh, web, mobile, API, and we use, of course, uh, Jenkins uh, pipelines for our uh, CI CD. Uh, also, we use a web driver, Apium, uh, and of course, we are heavily supporters of uh, JavaScript for our solution. Thank you a lot. A lot. Thank you, Evi. Uh, thanks to Epignosis for all the support. Uh, now, I would like to invite on stage Argiro Golfi from Tassis. Tell us a few words. Uh, this is the last uh, uh, sponsor before our break. So, welcome, Aguiro. Kalispera. Hello, everybody, from me as well. I'm Aguiro Golfi. I'm from Traces. Uh, for those who do not know Traces, we are a software development company. We were founded in 2004, so we're celebrating 15 years uh, in Greece, but our presence is all over Europe in our group. Uh, our services is... Um, do I change them or...? No problem. So I won't bother you with many uh, details. You can check the technical domains uh, on, on the slide. Uh, what I would like to show you is the uh, technology stack that maybe you're interested, you interested for. Um, well, but my main reason for being here is just to invite you to come to our, uh, to our offices and I welcome you there. So we can meet and discuss about um, your career expectations or what we do, etc. Here you can check some pictures. Uh, Traces is not new to such kind of initiatives. Uh, we were always being there in conferences, meetups, and such um, such events because we do believe that they offer many things in the community. But nothing would be possible and, not and we wouldn't be here if one year ago some little stars, some little geek stars, wouldn't come to my office and say, okay, let's do it. So we're really proud of them 
and I'm really thankful to work with them. Uh, if you want to join us, these are um, some uh, positions that they are open in our company. So um, just check us online. I will be happy also to talk to you at our booth. Many thanks to the organizers, the volunteers. Um, Koshike is really, um, it's really an honor to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, let's have a nice break. Thank you. Thank you, Argiro. Thank you for, t uh, for all the support, Rasses, and thank to all the sponsors for uh, keeping the support for this uh, Ministry of Testing in Athens. Uh, we're now going to have about 20 minutes break. I'd like to remind to all of you that we have a contest running for uh, one ticket for Selenium Conference that's given by Intrasoft and one uh, project management uh, seminar that's given by Hellenic American Union. So if you haven't scanned already the uh, QR code, go ahead. Okay? See you in 20 minutes.
Σε περίπου τρία λεπτά ξεκινάμε, καθίστε σιγά σιγά. Να ξέρετε ότι η σελίδα του διαγωνισμού θα κλείσει σε περίπου ένα τέταρτο εικοσάλεπτο. Όποιοι δεν έχετε συμμετάσχει, κάντε το τώρα. Ξεκινάμε σε λιγότερο από ένα λεπτό, παρακαλώ καθίστε. Τελευταία ευκαιρία για να συμμετάσχετε στην κλήρωση. Σε περίπου ένα τέταρτο, είκοσι λεπτά θα κλείσουμε τη σελίδα. Όποιος δεν έχει συμμετάσχει, παρακαλώ κάντε τώρα ό,τι είναι να κάνετε. Hello again and uh, welcome to the second part of uh, today's meetup. Uh, before moving to the nice presentation of Koske, I, I would like to invite on stage uh, Panagiotis Megremis from uh, Agile. Καλησπέρα uh, Panagioti. Hello everybody. First of all, I would like to say that I'm very excited to be here in the sixth meetup. It's a fact that Ministry of Testing is growing more and more. Uh, we have great talkers to participate in our meetup and this is great. Well done, guys. Let me introduce myself. My name is Panagiotis Megremis and I work as an SET, Software Engineering Test for Agile Actors Company. Test engineering is a discipline that has evolved a lot over time. I think we can feel that change in the air. Everyone is focused to produce new business value faster. Software these days can be built 
and released uh, more quickly than before. This has a huge impact in old school testing strategies and professions. Um, in Agile Actors, we believe that SET has a vital role in the team. Therefore, he should acquire the skills that will lead him to obtain a deeper knowledge of an application's life cycle, how the application is built, how the tests are running in different layers by using a test pyramid, and how we can make them to test, to test in parallel uh, for reducing the execution time. And at the end of the day, how the application is deployed on a production or a staging environment. Agile Actor's purpose is to develop its people by using three major pillars. Projects, trainings and coaching. Projects. Our clients do business in different fields like banking, insurance, lottery and recently big data. In our current projects, we use um, a variety of test stacks and frameworks such as Jeb, Spock, CucumberJS with Protractor or WebDriver.io. For mobile testing, we're using Appium whenever we want to test a Cordova-based app, a React Native or pure native application. Of course, when the time has come to create pipelines, we are big fans of Jenkins and especially Jenkins 2. Trainings. We provide trainings to our people so they can keep developing themselves. Uh, for test automation, we have courses for Cucumber, JebSpoke, and uh, Appium. Uh, moreover, internal uh, trainings are taking place uh, for people that they want to familiarize with uh, different areas like uh, Big Data or DevOps. And the third pillar, which is coaching, each employee in Agile Actor has, is considered as a coach and has a personal mentor. The coach, coach is responsible to, for um, advice and guide the coach to, uh, in order to achieve his personal goals and follow the career path that he's dreaming. I try to keep it short. I think that's all I had to say. I will take over the reins into our lovely guest and thank you very much. Thank you. We are very excited to have with us one of the most famous computer programmers of all time. Please welcome to the stage the CloudBees Chief Technology Officer and creator of Jenkins, Kosike Kaoguchi. All right. I am super impressed with the turnout of people. I wasn't expecting to see this many folks. So um, thank you very much for coming. Let's see if I can get this up. Yeah, so today I wanted to talk about the GitOps and Jenkins X, and then a little bit about the future of CI and CD. Now, how many of you know GitOps? All right, not, not actually, not that many. How about Jenkins X? Like, have you heard of Jenkins X? All right, so that's actually a little better. Um, so, you know, like everywhere I go, right? So I've been talking about, oh, maybe this is not, oh, yeah, here it comes. So I guess I need to stay still close. So, you know, everywhere I go, I see this business getting turned into a technology business, right? So I was, before I come here, I was in Berlin and I was talking to lots of like a financial sectors and those people realize that the banking, for example, is now fundamentally a technology business. So they have to become a lot better at producing and running and operating testing software. And that's what's really truly happening in this decade. And that's, I'm sure you're feeling that in here in Greece as well. So, um, so this is a book that's written by uh, Accelerate. It's a book written by um, uh, Dora, which is a DevOps research institute, and they do some amazing works. Um, and then in one of these, uh, the, um, in, uh, in this book, Nicole Ferguson, so she was the CEO, and then this company got acquired by um, Google. So that also talks about how you know the instrument of their work is. Um, what what and what she's saying is, it's like a software delivery. The thing that we are doing is really an exercise in continuous improvement. So the idea is, you know, like 
every time we try to, well, this journey of improving how we produce software, it's kind of never ending. And that's sort of, you know, if you look at how the manufacturing sector works, for example, you see that that is actually really the case. Um, so in particular, I think a lot of companies, now different part of the world at the different part of the maturity curve, but a lot, a lot of companies going through is this, cross this hump where on one hand, we wanna be fast at the throughput. In other words, like we wanna be producing newer features faster to the productions, but at the same time, we also need to maintain the stability. Now, in other words, like the production needs to be always working. And traditionally, these two things have been seen as a conflicting factor, uh, but under this continuous delivery as a practice, I think the people are recognizing that these things actually go hand in hand. You don't have to choose one over the other. So that's sort of really broadly what's going on. Um, and a lot of technology, a lot of tooling and processes to enable these practices are getting lots of interest. So naturally, like a one of those, like a key enabling technology piece that a lot of software development team are looking to, to achieve those two goals at the same time is Kubernetes. I think in some of the earlier, you know, the, uh, the sponsors conversations are talking about the technology stack this Kubernetes showed up. So I assume you guys are also pretty familiar with that. Um, but uh, you know, the Kubernetes, I think of it really as a, kind of new operating system, right? Back then when the Linux came along and it sort of became a de facto operating system layer for people developing applications. Now, in this world, in, the, you know, in this uh, 21st century where people are writing distributed applications, this really is the new, new operating system layer. Um, and there's a lot to like in the fact that, for example, it is a common platform across all the major cloud providers and then so you don't get locked into a specific vendors. Um, and then obviously it's got a number of functionalities that makes it useful for writing distributed applications. But um, perhaps like a most importantly, and then this one is really close to my heart, um, is that the Kubernetes is designed to be extensible. So um, what that enables is like a lot of random people in the community or in this broader global community can build some interesting stuff on top of the Kubernetes and they kind of all look and feel naturally like a part of the Kubernetes. So um, I've been to KubeCon uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. That happened in Barcelona. Uh, did any one of you go there? Yeah, the only one, oh, the two, two, three guys. So you see that there's this amazing amount of activities and innovation happening in this space. So, um, you know, what's happening is because this technology is somewhat disruptive and then like, you know, there are so much hype and interest around it, Everyone is trying to rebuild this. I apologize for the, uh, the quality of the screen, but um, everyone is trying to rebuild this familiar DevOps cycle around this new tooling, right? So in some sense, like, you know, we've been doing these things all along, like, you know, building the code and then very testing those and packaging it up and releasing and running in the production and monitoring and feeding that back to the, to the, um, to the development process. And that process itself hasn't really fundamentally changed, but exactly how you do it is obviously gonna be dependent on the particular runtime stacks and so on. So um, I know a lot of development team has kind of stopped, paused, um, and then they are trying to rewire themselves. So how do you do this familiar cycle on top of this new, this new technology? But um, I'm sure you also know this, like, I mean, the, but these, wiring and automations and like how you combine these bits and pieces together tends to be done in-house. In other words, like every software development team seems to be reinventing this wheel, um, which from my perspective seems like an awful waste of resources, right? Because it's not really, you know, you might be in the business of, I don't know, like selling a, a product or, well, I guess there's like one, like a ride sharing company. So that's your business. On the other hand, like a building the automation chain to produce the software on Kubernetes is not one of your core value. So despite the fact that a lot of people are reinventing this, so what's going on there? Um, so, in some, so that's what I mean by the new legacy. I feel like these custom wiring that the companies and software development teams build on their own seems to be largely a wasted effort. So instead, I think if you're in, 
this kind of the mindset of automation, I think what's not important is to review wiring these things together. Now, what did it then, then what is the important part? And I think that is this sort of like a developer experience or the user experience of how to make, how the software developer interact with the system of automation. Um, and then because that's the kind of expensive part uh, that needs training, education, and like process and mindset change. Um, and if you can come up with a reasonable interface and exactly what automation happens behind the scene kind of get less important or like a things that you can change. And then that's the context in which I think the GitOps is gaining a lot of popularity, interest, and awareness. Because I think the industry is kind of like a converging into this as a, as a, as a sort of like a user, user interface between the software developer and the rest of the, you know, the machine-driven automations. So, I guess the put sort of like a very simply, the GitOps is this idea that, you know, what the people do on the left hand side, you know, the coding changes and like a running the, and so on, testing and so on. Um, and then the operational side of the, the right hand side, um, and that handover happened in the Git repository, right? So, and then here, the, we are not just talking about the source code of the application, which obviously has already been the source, I mean, the, the uh, Git repository, but the capturing the state of the running system, like which version of the microservices are running uh, in the in production environment, or capturing the infrastructure definitions. Um, again, in some of the other responses slides, I saw names like Terraform, and it's on the same idea, right? So you can configure the entire cloud deployment from the load balancer to the database and all that stuff as a part of the texture configuration file. Um, and then you store them in the Git repository. So that captures the running state of the system. So you apply the same practices like code review, branching, all of those things that you've been doing to the source code of application, you now apply to every part of your you know, application runtime. So that's the kind of put the, Git, the GitOps in a nutshell. Now, so why is it that this stuff is getting popularity? So the one, you know, one reason is like, you know, the, I guess the developers and the engineers are used to using Git, um, but it turns out that this practice of GitOps also meets a number of important business requirements, which traditionally has been filled by, you know, like a writing a form or filling the world documents and I've seen some of those things in action. So for example, um, in any serious like a compliance related environments, uh, you need to have this like a level of auditability and traceability. For example, I'm sure some of you work in those environments where every change in the system needs to be tracked back to authorized requirements and you know like no single person should be able to push arbitrary code into production. So in a Git uh, when you control every aspect of the runtime in the Git by uh, controlling who gets access to what branches and like uh, by combining this with the code review and like a uh, pull request processes, you can provide the kind of auditability and access control that the, the business would need without creating this big boundary between the operations team and development team, which it has been recognized as anti-pattern to produce a higher throughput, right? Um, just by looking at the Git history, like you can see who made what changes for what reasons. The other thing is it's this practice of using Git is too diagnostic. So yeah, the Terraform, yeah, you might choose to use Terraform, which produces a set of configuration file, or you might use the AWS Cloud Formation, which kind of played a similar role. It's a different format, uh, but you can still bring in the Git. So that's another reason I think this practice is widely seen um, as applicable, and then you know, here it is not just about the Kubernetes. So, you know, the, um, you can also do this infrastructure as code through, for example, like Ansible or Puppet or Chef, if those are the still things that you're doing. Um, um, and then, you know, the reviewing um, and testing before you merge, I think, is kind of another key benefit because you don't want to. Um, you know, you don't want to be fiddling. The fiddling with production is always scary, and being able to, you know, the run the code review with other people to be able to hook in automation so that the more additional testing happens before change gets released. 
I think that's another key part, key things that the application developers enjoy. That's like a na now shifting down to the right hand side, to the operation side. Um, and naturally also because everything is captured in the Git repository, in case of production outages or major issues, it's very easy to roll things back into the non safe state or in case of a disaster recovery, um, you know, you can lose the whole thing, um, whole production environment and bring the same state back up from this like a same Git repository. So this part of the key requirements that makes um, the application work in this regulated environment, in the highly distributed, you know, fault tolerant environment, it really works very well um, with the GitOps. So if you, now, so the, the theory of GitOps is kind of easy. Um, in practice, where it gets, gets a bit of painful is, you know, you still have to hook all the automations. And in some sense, like, you know, I'm a software engineer, right? So um, I get the fun of it, like, okay, so you have a new toy that is Kubernetes, and you can figure out, like, how to use it, um, and then what automation needs to be hooked up at the what point. So, like, when a pull request happens, uh, you want to run these things. When it gets more, it's linked to this branch, you want to do those things, and so on and so forth. But it turns out that the, um, Properly wiring all these things up into a productive um, application development uh, on the top of Kubernetes is kind of a painful work. It's almost like opening a bonnet of a car and start tinkling in the engine room, right? So, like it takes installate. I mean, installing and operationalizing Kubernetes is a work of its own. Um, so much so that um, in the KubeCon keynote. The uh, one of the SRE from the Spotify, which is generally seen as a you know, cutting edge engineering company, they showed up and they talked about this like a major failure story in which they blew up the, they basically like ended up destroying the, like a two thirds of the entire production environment because they, they didn't do the right, they, you know, they, did, they weren't familiar enough with Kubernetes. So that's a kind of operational challenges. Um, Anyone try to upgrade Kubernetes installation in place would know how difficult it is. And then, you know, this ecosystem is still going through a rapid innovations. So you really need to be kind of keeping an eye on what's going on um, and then see that, oh, there is a new services and this is a new tool. And you have to be constantly looking at, out upon what makes sense for you. So that's, you know, and, and who has time for that, right? Um, and then, you know, I'd, if you haven't already moved the application to containers, well, you still have to do it. And often, like, that's used as a timing to also chop up the big monoliths into microservices, and that's also a major project on its own. And that brings in the new layer of, you know, like, service mesh or monitoring and a whole new set of practices that you have, your team hasn't done before. And then, like, even after you figure out the tooling, okay, so what is this, you know, you need to learn the GitOps thing, like, what's the best practices of software delivery, like, how do you deal with the secrets, there's like an endless list of questions you have to figure out. So, the way I see it, and then the part of the reasons the Jenkins project started doing Jenkins X is, you shouldn't be reinventing these things, like, we should be having, like, a one common like a common, well understood practice to do these things readily available for you. Right? Because after all, like I showed in the earlier slides, the basic idea of this continuous delivery loop hasn't really changed. Right? It's like how you wire up the rest of the tooling that has changed. So that's what the kind of key idea behind Jenkins X. So the vision of Jenkins X um, is that we are trying to, so we figure out, we, the people in the Jenkins community who live and breathe Kubernetes day in, day out, um, they're gonna like, look at the, um, the best practices of how to continuously deliver cloud native applications, and then we will put them together. Um, and then when I talk about the continuous delivery here, in Jenkins, traditionally we've been mostly talking about the build and test and this like a unit of job, but in this context, in Jenkins X context, you know, our continuous delivery means the entire span of the software development all the way from pull request to running application in production to getting the result and feeding back to the development process. So the entire spectrum. Um, and then people who you know, live and breathe this ecosystem with Kubernetes, uh, they'll watch out for this bleeding software that's happening in the Kubernetes ecosystem and we will wire them up in the right way that achieve the said best practices. Right? 
And in order to make this more accessible to busy application developers, um, all of that complication is hidden behind a fairly pleasant high-level command line interface tool. And that's really what Jenkins X is. It's, like, um, it's, a develop, it's a command line tool that the developer interacts with by using a higher level concept that they, they understand. It's things like uh, promoting application from a dev environment to QA environment and then to QA to pre-prod to pre-prod to production and so on, right? Um, or, um, um, or that very notion of environment for application. Like that's something we all have been doing for a while, right? There's nothing that, what, nothing that like, just because we are using Kubernetes, it doesn't really change. What changes is like how that concept maps to Kubernetes. So again, the high, by having a high level CLI, uh, we can hide those complexity behind the scene. So in order to make this workable, kind of like a key idea that makes all of this possible is that Jenkins X provides this one opinionated way of doing continuous, like a, doing continuous delivery of cloud native applications. And then the entire effort is built around making that easy enough. So as a result, what we are hoping to achieve is kind of put the Kubernetes back into where it's supposed to be, which is an implementation detail, means to the end, where the end for you is to produce higher quality applications faster. Um, the, you know, the, the meeting both the, uh, the throughput and stability, as I put in the obvious slide. So um, another way to look at this, because it sounds like most of the people here are already familiar with Jenkins, um, another way to explain how the Jenkins and Jenkins X relate to each other is sometimes I think of Jenkins as a, just like a vast road network that spans the entire continent. Right? Because what I'm discovering, uh, well, like what I've been finding all along is every company does different software, you know, from COBOL application on the mainframe to embedded devices to, you know, the video games on the PlayStation to mobile app to backend web app to desktop .NET application. Like there's just incredible diversity of software development that's happening. And then people are all over the map on the maturity cycle. So everyone is kind of on the journey from going from one location to another. And what the Jenkins provided is like, it gave you a car that you can drive, right? And you can sort of like a tra take whatever turn that you wanted to take on the road, and then it will provide the flexibility to help you get to wherever you wanted to go. And even if you occasionally miss a turn, like it still be always busy you to eventually get to your destination, right? Um, but this flexibility kind of comes with a challenge, which is that the, you have to be in the driver's seat, so you know that you need to be driving. Now, what this, at the same time, um, what we started to recognize is there is a common destination that everyone is trying to go. So this, you know, the cloud native web application is a great example. Nobody really knows exactly what the cloud native web application is, but everyone wants to get there, right? So asking everyone to drive to a destination that they don't understand is kind of a painful process. So what we are trying to do in the Jenkins X is build a high-speed rail network on, on top of this continent, right? So it gets to these common destinations that is, is a me major metropolitan city that's being constructed, which is called Cloud Native Web Application. Um, and then so long as that's your destination, you just need to show up in a train station and then the, the billet train will arrive and then like, you, know, you just need to hop in and, and then like you relax and then uh, the train will take you there in no time because we, the people in the Jenkins community, are respond like you know, we take it to themselves to provide you the best experience to get to that destination faster and then you don't need to be driving. So that's the, that's the kind of key idea. Um, so the other thing is, you know, when we, whenever we talk about this opinionated software development, the challenge is always um, whether that particular opinionated flavor of doing things meet with what people want to do. Um, so just to kind of give you the idea of what we are generally trying to do here um, in Jenkins X, like what is the best practice that we are trying to preach um, is that, you know, we have this like a Git repository that captures uh, the state of the applications, so each of these applications, um, and then um, 
you know, for different environments, you have a Git repository that captures the state of those environments, right? So in the staging, you might be running 40 different microservices, each with different versions. All of that is captured there. In production, you probably be running the same 40 web applications, I mean, the microservices, but maybe a different versions. So that's the capture there. Um, and the general idea is like, you start the development on the branch, and then you do the code review and so on, and then that lands in the master, and then so that and th that change gets immediately reflected into the staging environment. So that's where the testing and so on can happen. And at some point, you can choose to run the promotion. So promotion is the idea that you know you build the confidence to a particular version of the app that's been running. So now it's time to bring it to the production, and that creates a corresponding change in the production. And then through the automation, which happens on Jenkins, which is why Jenkins X is called Jenkins, these things get reflected into different environments. Um, so actually, this preview environment might be worth talking a little bit about. So this is one of the cool things about Jenkins X or the Kubernetes, actually. I should say this is the one of the cool things that the Kubernetes enables that the Jenkins X leverages in ways that doesn't add cognitive overhead for you. Um, is that as soon as you create a pull request, like it creates this corresponding preview environment and then um, run the application under test on it. So you can interact with those apps. Um, but anyway, so um, the so the thing, hopefully what that picture was trying to tell you is that this best practice that the Jenkins X is preaching is in some sense nothing new. It's in fact quite, quite boring, right? Um, so the interesting thing about um, like playing with Jenkins X like, is that when you try it, it's surprisingly like at home, like a feel old and familiar because it's like it's not really imposing anything you didn't know before. So it's the you know it's it's it, the best practices promote ideas that hopefully again shouldn't be a news. Um, the things like uh, the keeping master branch always releasable, right? That's something hopefully you're already doing. Or the idea that the deployment should be happening often and in small quantities, um, or or that um, uh, the people, um, other people, the people working on different microservices, they need to be informed about the changes um, that are uh, that are happening in upstream. So these are the ideas that we promote, and then we build the tooling support and the automation to help that better. Um, so so yeah, so I guess. That's what, and then all of these best practices are captured in this like, Accelerate book. Um, and then, again, that helps you feel right at home when you pick Jenkins X. It's surprisingly exciting because it lets you use all this new technology innovation that's happening as we speak, but it's also surprisingly familiar and comfortable because what we do is very, um, is, is nothing new. The, the practices are nothing new. So behind the scene, like, the, so this is how Jenkins X kind of, you know, Jenkins X itself is a distributed application that consists of a number of services. Um, so it's obviously Jenkins, that's con Jenkins is a part of the puzzle, but it also, as you can see, it contains a number of other pieces, like a Helm and uh, uh, there's a web receiver of webhook um, uh, called, I forgot the, uh, I forgot the name of it. Um, but uh, so, it, you know, it's a much bigger system that uses Jenkins as a part of it, and that's what Jenkins X is. So, um, and then it also is like a fundamentally multi-cloud ready. So, um, obviously, the when it comes to Kubernetes, the GKE is probably the most well understood and you know the, the best behaving Kubernetes class, uh, the serv one of the Kubernetes services. But all of the other ones are just as well supported. And then, you know, any serious company who is trying to figure out how to do Kubernetes is also looking at multi-cloud, right? So that might have been like a little abstract in, um, in explaining. So I'll make this a little more concrete by kind of walking you through exactly like how you go use Jenkins X, right? So imagine like you're starting from like a scratch state. So, you know, I have a computer like this, like it doesn't have it really any, it, it, it doesn't really have anything. So the first thing you're gonna run is to install Jenkins X. So uh, in the Mac, you can install it from Homebrew. Um, so those two commands should be like a very no brainer. So what it does is install a Jenkins X, the command line tool, the, the heart of Jenkins X. 
Uh, and then you run this one command, jx create cluster, and then hit enter. And then it goes through a little bit of dialogue sessions. Uh, but um, at the end of that process, what, oops, um, what you get um, is you get the functioning Kubernetes cluster running on the cloud of your choice, maybe on you know, AWS or Azure or, um, or um, the, uh, the GKE, um, which runs all the necessary tools, the thing that I showed earlier in the block diagram, like a Jenkins service or like a prod, the, the web receiver or like a Helm chart uh, or the monocular, some th these are applications that help you catalog the microservices. Um, and um, so these tools are already running, also pre-configured and wired together so that they work well. And then you get these, the, by default, the staging and production environments defined. And like if you wanted to have more environments, like instead of two, if you wanted to have four, you can also do that. Um, and then you know, these are the environments in which the applications are would come in later. So this is a one-time installation process to basically bring up the whole, whole company. Um, and then so the next step is like now you need to bring the application on board, right? So there are two ways to go about this. Like if you wanted to create a new project, you can just do a JX create, and then this is a type of application that you can select. So Spring, what, this, what that command does is gonna give you a Spring Boot application that contains some right bits at the starting point. Uh, or if you already have an existing application, um, then you can run the JX import command and it introspects like uh, what files that you have in your uh, the source code repository and generate some additional stuff. So at the end of this process, what you get is you know the, some functioning based source code. So it's like initial skeleton code, but more importantly, the wiring that's necessary for building and deploying and doing the continuous delivery. So it's like a Jenkins file, that's the CICD definition, or the Docker file that defines the packaging. Um, or the Helm chart and so on. So none of these things, I mean, you don't really need to be expert on any of these things. It just gives you what you need. Um, and then it, not only that, it also why hooks up all the services behind the scenes. So it, you know, it can create a job, I mean, the repository on the GitHub. Um, it would configure the web hooks on this file so that like it, it wires up whenever the pull request opens, the right things happens. So again, in some sense, like, there's nothing art shattering here. These are the things in many ways you have already been doing every time you start a new project. It's just that now you don't have to do it because we did it for you, right? And you just automatically get what is like a best of the breed software development practices by just by running that JX import command. Um, and then it like, you know, it pushes all these files into the repository and then it the automation kicks in and it creates an initial release and it's gonna deploy the bits in the staging environment and all of that just by those two commands. So, um, so that's power up one time setup to bring on board the application. So, you know, how, but the real kind of the um, real work of the developing application is this like inner edit cycle, right? You, you check out the code, you edit those and you know, you create the pull request. And that part you know, doesn't really change. So we are not really imposing anything radically different on you. You're still gonna check out this code locally and you're gonna work with your ID of your choice, probably run some tests locally and then create the PR on GitHub. Um, and then at some point, right, you're gonna run the code review with your uh, colleagues and then merge that into the master branch, right? So that's what presumably you have already been doing. Now, what's different in the world of Jenkins X is like how much automation happens around those familiar workflow that you've been doing. So as soon as you file a PR, it automatically gets built and tested uh, without you doing any Jenkins configurations or like you know, the webhook wiring at all. Um, and then application that's being like a uh, um, code reviewed in the pull request gets its own PR specific preview environment. Um, so like I mentioned, like, you know, if a designer wants to see this new application, like they can actually see the running app instead of just looking at the code. Um, so that's really powerful uh, ways to interact with this. And this environment will be gone as soon as you merge the PR. Um, and then once you merge it, yeah, the, uh, the new master branch that got the new changes gets automatically built and tested again. Um, and then like, that, cr that creates a new 
burden the release, right? So we really like promote this idea that the release should be frequent and like a small, like, you know, frequent and small as much as possible with the change log. So again, that helps the other people downstream to be informed about what's going on. And then by default, it gets automatically deployed to staging. Um, so all of that work happens just by you following, you know, just the opening a PR and merging it. Again, just think about previously how much work you had to do to get this level of automation in place, right? It's been a fairly solid chunk of work, especially if you have a lot of application. Now it's entirely, you know, the uh, frictionless. Um, and then finally, at some point, as what, you know, the, someone decides that this application, this particular version of the application needs to go into production. So that someone would run the command like this JX promote and specify the version uh, and then the, the environment that it's targeting to. And then that initiates the, like a release activity. So, um, so what do you, what I remember is like, we are promoting GitOps. So what this command does, well, what, what this JX promote command does not do is to talk to Kubernetes API and then like, you know, the deploy the new application. No, that's not what it does. Instead, what it does is it creates a, it checks out this state repository for the production environment and it makes the appropriate change to inform that the, now the 003 version should be running it. And it creates a PR so that operations team, for example, gets a notification that, oh, there's a new PR with, which proposes that this version 003 be deployed to production. And they can, for example, do the code review and the merge. And then so that way we meet this like a segregation requirements that the open, uh, the company needs. Um, and then as a result of that, eventually this like a new version uh, show up in production. So that's the kind of the key idea of the Jenkins X, and hopefully I'll be uh, able to get the point across that um, it really is all about taking what you guys should have been doing already and just making it so radically easier because so much happens automatically. So that's the kind of the, where are the Jenkins project is at right now in terms of like our current effort. So from here, I wanted to switch a gear a little bit and talk about you know, if that's now, like, what's tomorrow, right? Or maybe like a next year. Now, it's always a little bit of a fool's around to talk about the future because like, you know, I guess, I don't know if this session is recorded, but somebody's gonna watch this like a five years and ha ha, Tosca has been completely wrong. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, you know, like, um, what I think is, um, so, well, I go out, I, I make the point of going out to different software development teams around the world and kind of like talk to them to understand what they are doing. And in that process, I do see sort of like a certain common trends emerging, like both in terms of the pain point that they have on the Jenkins that we are trying to react to, but also the cutting edge like a continuous delivery practices that they themselves are doing. So what I'm trying to tell you here is like what we are doing in the Jenkins project in reaction to those and what I'm seeing as a broader industry trend that we haven't really like acted on yet. So I'm starting, I'm, I'm gonna start a little closer to the home front. So that is the, what we are trying to improve in Jenkins. Um, so, um, you know, when I, when I created Jenkins, which is already 15 years ago, the demand of automation was just so much smaller compared to the demand of automation today. Right? Some of the earlier lightning talks talked about, you know, when this was so successful, uh, there was like a angry Jenkins picture is, oh, everyone like tried to put more workload on it and then create a disaster. Um, so, you know, we need, so the, the point is like, we need to deliver this like entirely new level of uh, scalability uh, in, in, in Jenkins. So that's the effort that we call the serverless Jenkins. The, the basic idea here is that um, we are trying to basically turn Jenkins itself into a distributed application that runs in this function as a service style or like a serverless, if you want to call it that way. Right? So the idea is like every time a build request is arrived, it creates a small process that oversees the con and control the entire process of that, that one, one build and then it's going to be gone at the end. Right, so that's kind of like how you do it. If you are re rewriting Jenkins from scratch in 2019, that's how you're gonna do it. So that's the work that we are doing at the moment. And then if you know anything about the function the service style, then hopefully this, the benefits that this brings like a scalability and better isolation should be obvious, right? Because in this way, 
even if that one container blows up, like you know, no, none of the other builds gets affected. Um, and of, of also, like you know, the the cluster scheduler like Kubernetes ensure that there's a higher level of scalability and elasticity. Um, and then, so the great news is this work has been kind of underway for a while, um, and the Jenkins X already uses Jenkins in this manner. So when you pick up the Jenkins X, some of these like a key long running friction that we had, like if you have a giant Jenkins master, like you can't really restart them. There's no good time to restart that. Like there's not, that, that just simply not, that stops being a problem in this new world. Um, and we are trying to bring like a more of that um, into you know, the, the broader use cases. So um, next thing I wanted to talk about um, is, I think is uh, this recognition um, that I think that traditionally, and then I kind of felt a little bit of this in this forum too. I think historically, it was understood that the testing is what stands between this higher throughput. I mean, I'm sorry, the testing is what stands in between the crappy code that the developer produces from hitting the production and like burning up in a campfire, right? So when I talked about this mindset between, you know, the people who wanted to uh, have a higher throughput, like a more features rapidly into production, and then that, that, that's in this perceived conflict between the stability of the runtime. I think it's this mindset that the like a QA testing is the needs to contain this like a throughput. Um, so I think what I'm seeing out there now is this perception change. I think like the the I the, you know this um, the I don't know how to put this well, but the quality of the code is not like defended only by the testing. Instead, we are trying to leverage the fact that now the single team spans the entire software development cycle from the like a code review to the, all the way to production. Like that's what the DevOps idea is all about. So let's use that depth, the access that you have to the production, to assist the stability, assist the quality, and that's sort of like the underlying theme that's running in many of the things going on. So let me explain that a little bit more. Um, so. What's going on, for example, is, so I'm sure you heard about things like a feature flags. So I see it as a one of the ways in which you can contain the quality because like you're releasing these new things that you are not entirely sure to production. So when it does blow up, you need to be able to contain that damage. And that's what the feature flag enables without like going through the entire redeployment cycle and recertification. Like you can just tweak the flag at the runtime and then control the amount of exposure or just cut off the new, like a better feature altogether. Um, or this idea of the circuit breaker, it's the idea that you know, the, when you have a complicated system, some parts of it, it's gonna fail. And so let's just accept that and instead think about when that fire starts to happen in let's say this part of the system, like what can we do to make sure it doesn't spread to the rest of the system, right? So that's another way to ensure quality, the quality in the sense that the end user perceives them but by means other than testing, right? The canary deployment is another one, like, okay, it's, it's on fundamentally accepting that the newer deployment might contain problems, right? So let's not just rely on the test to catch all of those, let's accept the fact that some of them is gonna seep through, um, and instead what we can do at the like a deployment time to progressively expose this thing so that the, when the monitor combined with the monitoring system, if we notice that something is odd, we can rapidly roll back. So these, so these are all, uh, and then I talked about observability in this context of say canary deployment, but like uh, keeping an eye on what's going on in the production at every level of the detail is one of the key ways to react to this like a like, you know, far fire start burning. It's like a smoke detector to be able to contain the damage before you know, the, the ent entire house gets burned down. So I think what's really going on in, on in the world is all these practices are seen as like the new generation of QA, that's how I think of it. Um, and then so I think what that means for the you know, test, I think the QA engineers is that I think their roles are really like fundamentally shifting. I think it shouldn't be only seen, the QA engineer's responsibility shouldn't be only seen as running the test to make sure that the bits are in higher quality, but I think they have a lot bigger role that they can play, like working together with ops and devs, and that's the whole kind of like, 
you know, the ghost is the mantra of uh, DevOps of one thing. Um, another way to look at this, and then this I've also see, um, in s I've seen in some really like impressive continuous delivery implementations that's done in various team, uh, is this idea that like they, they, they find ways to utilize production traffic to help assist the quality. Um, because ultimately, like there's nothing like production, really. Like no amount of testing can stress the system in ways that the production would. Um, so let's just use production is really the idea. So one of the like uh, patterns that I've seen used uh, is this idea that like a request that's coming in uh, to the production service gets mirrored to this parallel testing environment. And then so they serve the same request twice and they monitor the differences between response. So I was um, talking to this like, uh, you know, the mapping services. So the request that comes in is like, I wanna go from point A to point B and they calculate the routes. Right? So every time they tweak the algorithm like a slightly, these behavior change, but it's awfully hard to test, right? But if you're looking at this uh, traffic mirroring technology, what they can do is they can statistically compare the re response between the actual productions and then this like a, the, like a shadow production environment that's running the new, new version of the applications. And if the, they can apply the same KPI, like the response time SLA, or you know, the, what's the difference between the routes? Like, you know, if, you, if suddenly the newer version is start telling them uh, like a slower ride by say more than 10%, that sounds like a warning sign. So they can apply this statistic, statistical approach instead of ha coming up with this binary testing. Um, so that's been, uh, that's, that's widely used, that he thought it to be used by Google, for example. Another one is be probably A-B testing. That's probably more familiar practice, right? So that's another example of actually using production, actually using customers, uh, customers eyeball um, to, to compare, um, to test the new bits and make sure that the newer version is still meeting the necessary KPI. So uh, there was, um, let's see, uh, there was this fascinating story about how the Facebook really does A-B testing. So like what they are trying to do as, for example, at one point, you know, the, uh, so I guess, um, uh, let me step back. So in Facebook, like when you see somebody posting your picture, you can ask the Facebook to take down the picture because I guess you know, it violates their privacy. Now, Facebook had to do this manually. They had to hire people to like uh, respond to this reaction. So what they wanted to do is to like make those people, like have the people sort this out between themselves. So. And, it's, and those are kind of difficult engineering, like a soft um, engineering program, because like you're trying to tweak the human behavior. So it's not obvious what change you lead to the positive change in this direction. So they did a lot of like A-B testing. And in fact, so they have no idea why what they eventually did works, but every time they like make a little tweaks, they can tell that, oh, now the support load has been 5.2%, so this change must be good. And that's the kind of practice that you can really only do with production. Like again, that's kind of the broader, like uh, the, um, that, that, that this is the kind of practice that the production would enable um, that no other way would be possible. So I think that's uh, all, I think this, I think there'll be definitely more of these things gonna happen. Now, another thing I'm sort of seeing is this emergence of um, machine learning to assist the DevOps. Now, I'm not talking about uh, the machine learning projects themselves, which you know, I'm sure there's a lot of tons of those, like a recommendation engine. I'm talking about applying machine learning to help the soft, help improve the software development itself. Um, and that's, I, I think that's truly kind of uh, mind blowing. So uh, like one, one example, right? So um, let me set up the context a little. So this is a pretty big company. Um, they have a thousand of uh, software developers working on like a one, uh, essentially one monorepo. Um, and then so there's like a central DevOps team that's taking care of this entire infrastructure to, you know, to validate the changes and make sure that the, the quality is good and then eventually to the production. So, but because, you know, it's a big company, the time and money it takes to run all the tests around this big system, it's kind of uh, 
well, pretty expensive. It's in the order of tens of millions, I'd imagine, every year. Right? Um, so the question they ask is like, how can, I, how can we cut the cost of running all these tests or speeding up the test execution um, so that we can serve the developers better? And then, so the step one that they did um, is this dependency analysis. So in this, so this, um, this diamond, imagine this diamond is a file, and then this like a square is a module, and the circle is a test module. So from the, you know, this, their monorepo is organized in ways that the, this dependency diagram can be inferred based on the dependency, this in the build definition and so on. So what they did was, if somebody changed, let's say this file, uh, well, let's say this file here, then, you know, you can tell that, oh, this module needs to be rebuilt and this test needs to be run because they might be impacted. But we can also tell that these tests don't need to be run because like, they are not gonna be impacted by the change over there, right? So that's, um, so, they, they, so they have done that for the longest time. And then like, you know, in fact, it's pretty sophisticated system because um, um, this, you know, the actual graph is so big that it barely fits one computer's main memory. And then so they figure out the way to parallelize all of this like a test and the build execution, and build and test executions in ways that they meet the dependency and reusing artifacts from some earlier runs. And so all of that is quite impressive, but what's truly like, you know, the blew my mind was that they didn't stop there. So they, they sort of like a step two that they went is this based on this intuition that, you know, I think the test, as a tester, I think you, you probably already know this, which is that not every test is equally valuable, right? Like there seems to be some tests that like never fail. Like we have those because it feels good to have tests, but like they just, just, you know, tests that never fail is actually not adding any value. But we don't know which ones are those tests. So we just kind of like run those, right? Well, like we also have this mentally know some flaky tests. Like if you ask somebody, is working on the project long enough, or like th that test fails, and oh, just we run it again because like it just flipped from time to time, and there was, was like a tribal knowledge embedded in their head. So what they did um, is they thought, well, you know, humans can't learn this, but maybe we can train the machine learning model to figure that out. So, um, so they uh, the idea is like let's find, let's have the machine, let's f have the model identify the useful subset of the tests that's gonna most likely catch a potential problem in this given change. Um, so they train this, so you know, so this, they, so their system already processes 10 to the order of five, so that's uh, uh, the 100,000, uh, 100, order of 100,000 tests. I mean, the, the change going through the system every month. So they use just the 1% of it to train this model. Um, and then, um, and then the machine basically predicts, so like when, you file a, when I file a PR, the model will look at the files that they changed, and it's gonna think about the while, and then, I mean, they thought, think about like a 50 millisecond or so, and they figure out, oh, this you, you rerun this test. And then what they were able to do um, is that the, this, this Oracle, this program only selects about the third of the entire test case that they have. So right there, that's telling you that uh, basically two thirds of the tests are not adding any values, and this model would know exactly which ones of those things are. And every time you run like a subset of the test, you wonder maybe like it fails to catch the problem in this proposed change, but this model would only do the efficiency if about 0.1%, meaning like every thousand changes, uh, it only fails to, it only let go incorrectly, like a one, one bad changes for every thousand of those. So basically negligible. Um, and then so for the negligible loss of the quality is they cut the infrastructure cost in half. So like in the tens of millions of dollars of saving. And that's, that's, that's truly, that's truly amazing. Um, so because, um, yeah, so th the, the, that, that some companies are already, have already done this. Um, when you know the most of us are just like it, it's just so far ahead of the game, and I, so that I, I was really too impressed with this. Another example was um, um, is a different company now. So in this company, the, there's a this like a massive services that's like oversaw by the SRE team, um, and then uh, so this team, uh, this SRE team, is overseeing like a hundred of microservices, and they're all 
in a pretty, you know, like a con they, they already achieved a very high level of uh, deployment frequency, right? So these hundreds of applications are deploying on average once per day. So how many of you are already there, right? We're probably not there yet. Most of you, I bet they're not there yet. Oh, yeah, there's one, one lady over there, so congratulations. But the rest of us are not there. Uh, now, but so, but if you, ima you can imagine like in situations like this, SRE team has basically no idea what change is landing in production because on average they're seeing like hundreds of deployments per day. But these, it is SRE team that needs to make sure that the production is working. So naturally what, wa what they wanted to do is to flag a risky deployment before it hits the production so that they can react to it. And then so the, here's, so they, you know, they basically did a similar thing. So they trained a machine learning model. They collect, they used the, uh, the past one year worth of deployment record, which about the 40,000th of deployments, of which just 100 of those are failed deployments. Um, and then like, uh, they trained the model to be able to see if they can detect which deployment is more risky because, oh, this deployment contains these changes, so that must, that, that looks, that historically, that looks less risky. Now, I should call this attention to the fact that, you know, to me, I don't know about you, but to me, failing only 100 times out of 40,000 deployments looks pretty amazing. It's like a failure rate of 0.25%. Uh, uh, I mean, the, how many of you are that, that good? I, you know, but these guys are not happy with even that. So that's like, a, the, like an uh, impressive thing, number one. But the model was able to actually predict 99% of the failures. So in other words, like this model is almost like a perfect predictor of, oh, that deployment is gonna fail, and 99% of it, it actually fails, okay? Um, uh, and then the, the false alarm rate is just 5%. So when it incorrectly flags the error, I'm sorry, so I guess I, I got the 99% part wrong. The idea is like, um, things, this, this model would almost never fail to predict, and then the false alarm rate is like, how many, like if I raise, uh, if the model raises a flag that, oh, it's gonna be risky, how many of them would actually fail? So most of them are pretty, like incredibly accurate. Um, so, so what, and then, so what they are doing, so this is still kind of like early in the game, but what they are trying to do um, is, um, well, the, the couple of things, like a few things that they learned. So before they deploy the machine learning, they are relying on humans to declare. So when they deploy, when the development team deploys a new change, they can check the box saying, you know, we think this is high risk, so I want, we want the SRE team to be paying a close attention. And they were able to like uh, actually quantify that how unreliable that metrics is. Um, the another thing is uh, uh, the, so they were able to also quantify that when the small changes just like a slip through the process like a rapidly, you know, you know this feeling of, oh, it's just this like a tiny change. I'm, th I'm sure it's gonna be totally fine. And it actually, that's turned out that these changes are more risky. And then, so what's amazing is, is like, again, anecdotally we know these things, but if you can actually quantify them in the numbers, then you can control the node at the right level in ways that the nobody is objecting because there's a graph that shows uh, when we when we control this, let's say time s necessary time span to the deployment to from let's say like a three hours to five hours, then we'd be able to reduce the deployment rate by say ten percent. I'm just making up the number, but you get the idea, right? So what used to be like, you know, the careful craftsman's like a like a, you know the put the wind like a finger in the wind thing became just a science, basically no brainer decisions. Um, Another thing that they were able to quantify is that the more risky code tends to be a service that's been around for longest time. Again, anecdotally, that's not a surprise. Like we know, we all know that the long running code, which is like a maintained time after time, is gonna be really become fragile. Again, that's nothing new, but they can now quantify this. They could say like every added year that the microservice is gonna leave, increase the deployment failure by say 10%, and that's tied to the production like metrics and revenue numbers. So suddenly, this thing that we used to, like this, this call, this, this perpetual call from developer that, oh, like we need the time for refactoring, or like we need to rewrite, have saved some time to rewrite the, like, uh, the application in, o in order to kind of keep the healthy state of the system, which like a no same boss would ever buy. Now it's just a kind of dumb question because you can put the number on these things. 
So not only they were able to kind of confirm what we already knew, but sort of like tell the, sort of quantify them in ways that the organizations can apply the right level of resources. Um, so I think that's actually a truly significant improvement. So, um, and I imagine like what you can do with this kind of system, right? So, you know, the, the what they, I believe what they're thinking about is um, if the model, so if, even if the model flags this as a, like a high deployment risk, they can't really stop them because, you know, like production, the new, new feature of the bug fixes, that needs to be delivered to the production. But what they can do is to apply different processes when the when the system when the deployment is deemed high risk, so for example, maybe they can demand that somebody from the engineering team be on call, um, or they can be like a warming up. The they can keep the previous version around a longer time, to, so that the in case of a rec uh, recovery, the impact would be smaller. So, it, you know, there's uh, so much potential to like uh, use information like this in ways that hasn't been possible. So, those are also those are all great, but it's also for me, like I uh, paint this picture of the future that's, I don't know if I like it, which is, I think we used to think that um, smaller elite team, like a team of elite developers are able to do things in ways that the no larger guys could do. It's like a David versus Goliath story, right? I guess the David is a smaller guy. So, you know, the nimble team, we thought, would be able to outsmart the big companies. But if you think about these two audio cases that I mentioned, it's the larger company who were able to do these amazing things because they were able to harness the data that's produced. And smaller companies don't have enough data to be able to do these kind of practices. So in some sense, I feel like, well, I thought the you know, Goliath was supposed to be like a slow and like a clumsy, but it turned out that some Goliaths are actually a whole lot faster and nimble than David. And that's not like, you know, what, think about like what that means could be pretty depressing future, I think. And if you think about, again, the manufacturing space, that's kind of already happening. You know, like you can't, it's like, it's, it's simply not possible for various reasons to produce, say, like a, a, a micro microchip at the, you know, like a three people company, right? The garage shop, like it's just not possible. So there are scale benefits. So maybe the software development is also becoming into the world where scale benefit does exist so that the larger company gets faster and faster, and the smaller guys, like the rest of us, can never catch up. And sometimes when you look at the Google, for example, like I already feel like that's kind of happening, right? The Google seems to be able to have this like a killer infrastructure that makes their developers so much more productive that I don't know how the rest of us could catch up. And I thought and like what this seems to be, what, what these things are pointing toward is like, maybe it's not just Google. I think it's a, like a growing trend that there's some, some winners who really win, and the rest of us might kind of well, die out, really. So um, I think that's kind of like I need to wrap this up. So um, what I was trying to tell is, you know, I think every organization is really becoming, trying to get better at software delivery. Um, and the Kubernetes, I think, is seen as a very exciting technology to enable that faster software delivery. But at the same time, because of the, this nature of this rapid evolution um, and the this being a new technology, for the application development team, I think it can be a detractor. Um, so I think what is really important for the like, automation folks to think about is the developer experience of how the automation is interact with people. And I think that's the GitOps. That's, getting, that's what, where we are converging. Um, and then the Jenkins X brings this, you know, the DX, this GitOps, to the Kubernetes without you rolling your own. Um, and then because the you know, CI CD practices uh, continuously evolving, um, we also trying to improve Jenkins, like a service Jenkins. And beyond that, that uh, like a David and Goliath story is basically just my future prediction that may you know, turn, or turn out to be right or wrong in five years. So um, with that, I think I wanted to like, wrap up this main talk. So uh, thank you very much for... Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Anybody? No? Okay, then. Oh, sorry. 
I think it was in slide 40, uh, your third bullet. Could you say a few more words about what you meant with long um, maintenance or long running code? Um, do you mean code that's been uh, been sustained for a long period, or what uh, did you mean? Uh, so I, I think you must be talking about uh, this guy. Yeah, yeah so the third bullet. So uh, so the, the so they so they looked at the what the model is predicting. Like basically, you know, so this machine learning model was supposed to predict what changes is likely going to lead to uh, deployment error. And then so you can introspect the model to see what, what attributes in the change that the model is looking at. And they were able to identify that the changes that's made to like a, long, like a legacy code, basically, are more risky. And All that's, right. again, like that should be, shouldn't be a surprise. Okay, right? so yeah, yeah, if you touch legacy code, you have more risks of uh, failure. Say that, say that again? If you touch legacy code, you increase your risk of failure. Yes, oh, that's yes. Okay. Yeah, but the breakthrough is the fact that they can put the number on it, like how much it gets worse at what time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, so uh, two questions. The first one about Jenkins X. Uh, how computable is it? Um, so the, the example gave, ma gave us is uh, uh, that it uh, spawns a Kubernetes cluster on a cl uh, on public cloud or private cloud, and then it uses uh, GitHub. I mean, okay, so most companies have different uh, different methods to store their Git repositories. Does it uh, is it configurable there? And then. Uh, some companies may not use uh, a specific cloud providers, uh, Route 53 DNS records, for example. So uh, how configurable is it in the pipeline that it builds? Yeah, so um, so I used the GitHub as an example, but I believe it also supports GitLab already. Um, and beyond that, it's the same Jenkins uh, story, which is, you know, there's a API and then there's an extension point. So you know, like we prove that you can support multiple things by doing GitHub and GitLab. So if you wanted to do the Git Hubbers or something else, like it's basically waiting for somebody else in the like a community to like step up and do it. Um, and then your other question was, I guess the, yeah, maybe not public cloud. I think it also supports um, OpenShift and then some Arcane IBM stuff that I don't know, but I, again, it's the same story. Um, I think you might already know that the Kubernetes does behave, different distribution of Kubernetes does behave differently. So it's largely the matter of like a testing and like a they put in the, um, the right pieces for the right target environment. Um, and then so we happen to be, I think the most people running Kubernetes workloads on GKE and Amazon, uh, I mean AKS, I, I EKS. So, um, so that's, I think we are, the support is get better, but it doesn't mean like we are exclusive or anything like that. Uh, and the second question is more phil philosophical question. So two years ago, on the container scheduling environment, we hear queues like DCOS, Mesos, uh, Nomad with console. Uh, 2019, we only hear about Kubernetes. What's yeah. what's your take on the and and a lot of software tools like Jenkins X or most of the newer services, service meshes like Istio and Linkerd too, and those are just for Kubernetes. What's your take on the dominance of Kubernetes in this environment? Right. Yeah. I mean. I mean, those of us who have been living long enough, we know the same story, right? I mean, the, it's, um, it's um, the, because everyone is trying to bet on the winning horse. So early on, like, which horse is winning, it's not clear. So, like, it's messy. But once, like, the, the somebody kind of gets a little bit ahead, everyone else kind of piles onto it, and then so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that's sort of like a nature of this world. Um, and then the Kubernetes just so happened to be, I mean, got in retrospect, you can see why it, it won. You know, like a Google is very credible. Like, you know, the, the Borgs, they have a lot of experience. And this extensibility stuff, they only have missiles and so on. They didn't have it well enough. So that's kind of key if you wanted to create a large ecosystem of lots of people trying to pull this thing in their own direction. But without extensibility, you can never really do that. So. You can always like a uh, retroactive, like, you know, from the with the power, magic power of the hindsight, you can tell why Kubernetes won. But if you ask me, it's really like it's again, it's a fool's errand to try to predict the future. But um, it's, it just happens. I mean, those convergence happens at some point in the project. You know, the beta is a VHS, and like and this, this whole space is a history repeating number of times. So again, if I may just 
inside one more product to Jenkins X. And that kind of, like there's a lot of higher layers. So Kubernetes layer has clear winning holes, but if you look at, let's say, service mesh or like a network proxy, like you got to have like the, uh, you know, Linkerd and Envoy and like all that, Istio and so on. It's still playing out exactly like which one it's gonna win. And, but again, everyone is trying to bet on the winning horse. So I, I, I bet like within a year or two, like one of those is gonna basically eat out the whole space. So you really don't wanna be like wasting your time trying to like, be trying to like uh, predict that and then uh, build your custom thing. Like uh, just forget about it. Like uh, let focus on the higher layer. And like, let's just run JX promote. And behind, like, if he uses a link RD or like Istio, like, who cares, right? So that's the idea, if you ask me. So, yeah. Anybody else? No. Okay. You can proceed. Thank you, up with this Thank you very much. <laughs>